This isn't, okay, good. Okay, everyone. Let's see if we can take our seats. Reverend Christina. Come on up, sure, sure. That was a lot of fun, right? Oh, it's always great to greet one another and bless one another. And I have the honor of introducing Reverend Christina Pajuli. She's going to be giving the word this morning. And it is always great. I always love to hear you. And I know you're filled with the power of the Spirit. And we're ready Amen. to receive. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Marlene. Um, thank you, thank you, Life Church. Manoj, are you coming? Um, you just let me come up here by myself today. <laughs> Good morning. We are so thankful for Life Church. Um, when I heard about Pastor Lou, I said, "Is there anything I can do? Can we preach for you? Can we help?" He said, "Please go and give an update about what's going on with India and Nepal, and uh, share the word." So. Manoj is going to give a, a brief update of kind of where we are. Some of you know we came home from the mission field uh, last summer, and we've been here. We had our third baby, and he's now seven months old, which is crazy, yes. Today's his first day in the nursery. Um, but we, we have some changes, so we want to share that with you, and Manoj is going to update you on that, and then I will share the word. Um. Personally, we as a family, we just want to thank uh, the church, and uh, you guys have been amazing family to us, and uh, I was just like telling somebody, I'm a son-in-law to this church, uh, because Christina was raised in this church, so, um, and Pastor Lou uh, has been amazing pastor um, uh, to us, uh, personally as a family, and uh, I just see, uh, you know, most of the time, like, people uh, take the term, like, servant leadership. I kind of, like, you know, I'm abnormal to understand that concept, servant leadership. Uh, but I do understand, like, parental leadership. He has uh, led us, not just, like, literally, we just call him Chacha Lu. Chacha means, like, his uncle. And um, our children, uh, Hadesa and um, Jia, they have adopted him like a grandpa. Uh, so um, they, they they really deeply deeply uh, love him because they see how he has uh, he has loved us you know as a family and I just want to thank the board uh, of the Life Church uh, they have been tremendous uh, help to us um, throughout this uh, basically um, you know it's been ten years the church has been stood along with Christina. But personally, as a family, you know, it's been a seven years. Uh, but earlier, it was AGWM. Now, after, you know, a, when she had to get out of AGWM, and the church has actually adapted us as a uh, mission team or, um, you know, uh, missionaries um, uh, from the church. And it's been seven years that uh, the church has been standing along with us. And I just want to thank the uh, board members and the elders uh, tremendously like time and now again they have uh, poured out their wisdom and uh, supported us like through their prayers and encouragement um, and the congregation especially um, you know the, some of you do support financially some of you support emotionally um, uh, but uh, throughout these seven years that I have felt that uh, you know I'm not a son-in-law but the son to this church and you guys have loved us and supported us like really, really well. And because of that, we are together able to achieve like some of the things which we achieved during these seven years. Um, we were uh, 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 last these seven years, uh, three people uh, to whom we supported and actually some of the two boys, they lived in our home and finished their high school and then went to the college. Uh, uh, one is Sandhya Sresht, one girl, she was graduated, and two boys, like they graduated their um, bachelor in theology degree, uh, which is like Ratan Magar and uh, Rajiv, who lived with us and just being able to uh, accomplish uh, 
And Christina was like able to, you know, a couple of months back, she was able to go and attend their graduation um, in India along with other three ladies. Uh, so we were able to uh, get that together. Uh, we were able to establish Global School Bus, uh, which is a center in Nepal, where we are able to accommodate like around 32 boys like at the same time. That kind of facility we built there, and we we together, you know, able to build that. And uh, uh, last year, like the three boys, the first batch they came and graduated. One is went back to his own village and like serving along with his pastor. One guy, like he. We bought electric Rexa for him, and uh, he drives electric Rexa, and he's doing his uh, bachelor in social work at the same town. And he drives the Rexa around this town and prays for the town, and uh, he is responsible for himself, like he's earning enough money to sustain himself and do college. Uh, we were able to support that one uh, as well. And um, this, at the right moment, present time, we do have like seven boys uh, living in the hostel, and they are um, doing their bat uh, the diploma in theology. At the same time, they are finishing their high school together. And this year, we are looking forward to sponsor these boys to go to seminary for their bachelor in theology. And uh, most of these boys, they come from the western part of like a region where is a still a lot of people group are unreached. And we are hoping them to become a seed that one day after finishing their seminaries, they will go back to their own villages and start the, uh, you know, start the ministry. Um, so, and the chicken farm, we started, like it's in the research kind of like, you know, project. Uh, uh, I don't know how many of you know uh, I never met that person before, and I just approached him through um, Mike, uh, Dan, uh, Mike um, McGinnis, um, the Chick Fil A guy, and he gave us two thousand U.S. dollar, and we and like s others, little bit, other, you know, from other uh, support money, we were able to put together, and we do have like around like you know thirty, forty chickens like in the um, um, hostel. Just idea of like how could we just sustain the ministry there, like hostel. It's in the still research uh, project, you know. The, um, we don't want to put tons of money if we realize that is not going to sustain the hostel. So it's in the verge of that, like as we were, like still praying and thinking how to move ahead. Um, uh, and we were able to build the church, uh, support to build the church, a local church in Nepal, like where the center is based. And... Uh, this, uh, to this morning, I talked to the pastor in Nepal, and like he was just saying, they are just ready to put the roof, and that can accommodate 700 people into that church. And we were able to accomplish that together. If you would not have like stood along with us, we would not, you know, have able to do that one. This church gave around thirty thousand dollars towards that project. So. Um, now, like, you know, what is next for us? We came home, and we don't know. That was the, you know, question, like, most of the time people ask. But now we know a little bit. You know, I, t I was just sharing with some of my friends here. I was 16 years old when I encountered with the fire of pillar. Since then, I am chasing that pillar so far. Wherever the pillar goes, I walk. I say, like, let's get out of here because the pillar is moving. So this is the time God has brought us in the U.S. in a very uncertain and very difficult time for us as a family because we want to do what God wants us to do. And uh, many people, they drop their support, like, because we were in the U.S. here, and they ask, what are you doing? And we just say, we don't know. And uh, many people, they stood along with us, in our uncertainty, that reveals, like, you know, when we are in down or, like, we do or not, they trust us, and they stand along with us because they are a family. And we want to thank you for those people who stood along with us, like, even in our uncertainty or unknown. And um, we are in the birds. Now we know because I applied for PhD program. I could not get in, uh, not because I wasn't smart enough, most probably. Most probably, I could not bend what they want me to do. I was very stubborn what research project I want to do. 
and maybe they did not have resources for that or what it was, you know. But I learned lesson like, you know, from hard way. Maybe next time if I want to do P PhD, okay, I will wear your shoes. That's fine, you know. So um, now we know we are th praying and thinking and like um, we are moving in the season of like supporting, uh, s uh, raising funds again. And uh, we definitely, next year, we definitely gonna go back overseas. And I'm working, I worked in Amazon and I know how hard it is to make money in US. Uh, Sometimes people think in another country the money is on the tree. They can just like plug in America. I don't know what they think, you know. Um, and I understand how, you know, if somebody gives $20, it's a one hour of sweat and blood they're giving. And uh, now I'm working at um, uh, a downtown Syracuse Marriott. Uh, in a front desk, uh, it's a fun place to work. I meet like tremendous amount of people and I'm really enjoying. And um, again, I just want to take this opportunity and say thank you, Pastor Lou, uh, for standing with us as a family. You've been parent to us, uh, father figure to us, and you loved us well. And um, uh, I don't know what future holds, but one thing for sure, we are very thankful to you and your family. Uh, for loving on us as a father, and uh, we love you so much. Uh, let's pray for Christian. Lord, we just want to thank you for my wife, uh, the passion and the zeal when she was 12 years old, she got to chase your heart for her life, and uh, she married a man uh, from another country, and she sold herself like completely uh, for the mission, and Lord, I just want to bless her Thank you for our three children. They are tremendous blessing to us. Help us to raise them in your fear and in your, in, uh, and in your love, Lord. And Lord, I just want to anoint her, bless her. You speak through her mouth and give us a heart of acceptance and, um, uh, and bless my wife. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we came off the mission field last summer. We had our baby. We thought that Manoj would apply for his PhD and we would be here for about five years. And that didn't happen. And as many of you know, we can plan our ways, but God determines our steps. And so we are not disappointed that he didn't get into his PhD program. We're convinced that God already knew that, that God had a plan. and. Our hearts are still burning for the mission field, and so we know that um, we're going back. I mean, the option is not to stay here, let me tell you that. <laughs> uh, we love America, we love our, our family and our friends here, but, but we're not called to America. We're called overseas, and so if we're not staying here for that PhD, we're headed back. And so now uh, we're just beginning that process of itinerating again, uh, rebuilding our our support. We still have much support, but there's some to be rebuilt before we can leave. So we're looking at possibly next summer at going back officially. Um, we have a short little video from Hadessa for you today. So um, if you can play that, Kathy, that would be great. There's no sound. It's okay. Um. I um, learned about this one thing about Earth, um, because we all know about church, we might do something about that church. Um, did you ever know about about if you could? Because all of the people in church know about Jesus. How about? We all travel around the world, working as a team, and then and when we're spread out, and we just tell one person at a time. So, but do you know why? Do you know why we need to just tell one person? Because we want to teach people, more people about Jesus. But do you know why we just teach one, one people about Jesus, one family about Jesus? Do you know why? Because we becomes the other person might becomes if we say spread it on to the uh, other person, and if they say yes, then then it will spread on to a different person. But if we but we also need to say that just remember to say spread it on to the next person, and 
just remember to tell him too, just like what I said. And and spread it on. It spreads into a different country, a different country, a different person, a different person, and a different person all around the globe. And that's how everyone could find out yeah. about Jesus? Yeah. And, and then you... nobody's going to go to hell. I like this idea. So what do we need to do to start here in America? Uh, that's Travel on a plane. Go on a plane. And you just need to travel on a lot. So it might be a lot of work. If you have a baby, please don't go. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more, I think. It kind of got interrupted. And we so also there's... need to make, get up our strength and keep on going. This September, if you don't feel like going and if you feel like staying in the country and you're not in the country you're supposed to be, this September, hold up, hold up all your injury and, and pray to God to ask Him for more energy so you can get more energy to go around the world. Keep on going. Don't give up. Amen. Out of the mouth of babes, right? She just started talking one day, and I said, can I make a video of you? And she just kept going and going and going. I didn't plant this in her little mind. She just does it. Um, she has such an uh, evangelistic spirit, and she prays more passionately than I do for the lost. It's convicting. I'll hear her in her bedroom, like, interceding and praying, God, they don't know you. They need you. Jesus, save them. They're going to hell. And she's just interceding. And I'm like, Lord, I, I need more of that passion. I mean, I love you, and I want to see people saved, but I'm not praying like that some days. So she convicts me. Um, but she says, if you're not in the right country, if you're not in the country you're supposed to be in, if you don't want to go to the country you're supposed to be in, then you better pray for, for God to help you, to give you energy. So people often ask us what it's like to live on the mission field. People ask Hadessa, what is it like? They ask us, is it hard? Um, they ask us all different kinds of questions. Sometimes they're funny questions like, hey, do you eat um, frog eggs? And do you eat ants? And the answer is no, I haven't eaten those things, but I have eaten goat eyeballs and fish eyeballs and chicken feet, none of it by choice, mostly because I had to. Um, we get asked serious questions like, do you fear for your life? The answer is yes. There are many, many times where I fear for my life and not so much because of the fact that we're in a closed country and there's persecution, more so because the, the roads are crazy and there's accidents everywhere, and the hospitals are not good infrastructure. And so I, I worry about those things more than I do about the persecution. People ask us spiritual questions, like, have you ever seen someone be delivered from demonic possession? Yes. Um, in, in India and Nepal, it's much different than it is here in America, and you actually see that quite a bit. Um, I think it, it, in America, it just looks very different here. But there you see people slithering on the floor like a snake or barking like a dog and superhuman strength that it takes six grown men to hold down someone that's having a demonic attack. But you also see the power of the name of Jesus. And you see the glory of God at work. And you see that through deliverance in the name of Jesus, that not just that person comes to Christ, but sometimes their family and their community. Because as they go home and tell people about the change that's happened in them, people see the power of the name of Jesus. Um, people ask us things like, how many people have you saved? And, and how many villages have you brought Christ to? They ask us about if it's hard to live far away from family and what kind of things we miss in America. They ask me to speak in Hindi. The truth be told, it's the questions that people don't even know to ask that would actually define what our experience is like on the mission field the things that we see and hear and experience on a daily basis that shape our experience and that emotional connectedness to the mission field. 
I'm going to share some different examples of that. Um, it's the beggar woman standing on the road with a half-dead baby asking for money, for food. It's the homeless children walking in the snow barefoot. It's the family grieving in the next room over in the hospital over their dead child who died from common diarrhea because they didn't have clean drinking water, something that could have easily been prevented. It's my mother's heart hurting for those and wanting to hold my own even closer. It's the insurmountable, insurmountable need in the countries that we work in and the smallness of my human self. It's the river shores along the Ganges Hindu River where they throw their idols because they've expired and they have to get new ones for the new year because those gods are no longer good enough for the new year. And so the shore is filled with these idols. It's the people walking across the country naked with ashes spread over their body to prove to their God their dedication and their worth for his blessing. It's watching people perform ridiculous rituals out of fear of what their God might do if they don't do it. It's the pounding of my heart in response to the Holy Spirit as he says, go and make disciples. It's the poisonous snake crawling in my house next to my six-month-old. It's the countless hours worrying where the other snakes might be hiding in my house. It's the voice of God asking me to trust him more. It's the reverberating Muslim call to worship over the loudspeaker that echoes literally inside of you each day. It's both disturbing and annoying and eerie, and it reminds you of the purpose for why you're in the country. It's the heavy void of the eyes peering through behind the burqa of the woman who's crying out for freedom. It's the homeless child that's soaking wet at my door at 6 a.m., screaming and pounding at my gate, Auntie! Auntie! We're hungry! Let us in! At 6 a.m. because they didn't have food the night before. It's the filthy, dirty hands of those same beggar children touching my babies and holding them and cuddling them. It's the nagging of the Father God saying, Will you love them? Will you love them as your own? It's a six-hour trek to a village to see a man smile as you tell him about Jesus. It's the awe in your own soul as he tells you that he's been waiting 10 years for someone to come tell him more about Jesus. It's the days of altitude sickness that follow that trek, the days of sickness that follow after going on that trip that leave you in bed wondering if it's worth going again. It's the voice of God reminding me that his grace is sufficient for me. It's the incessant cultural differences that pound on your comfort zone and on that wall that you try to create and that Americanism that is so stuck in me. I want my own space. I want my quiet time. I want uh, my home to be my private place. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, the door starts being a revolving door. And from 8 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night, there's just people that come in your home. I, I think I've said it before, I often serve around 22 cups of chai in a day. That's not my comfort zone. I'm a very introverted extrovert. So that knocks on the, the comfort zone walls of my heart and, and brings me to my knees in humble surrender because my life is not my own and it has been paid for with a price. Many times people think that missionaries live some glorious life. It's almost ide idolized here in America. Like, oh, you're a missionary. Yeah, <laughs> that's good and bad, I think. Um, well, we come home off the field and we can share amazing stories and testimonies and you see the power of God and you hear the power of God. The missionary life is hard. And most of the time we leave out the physical and the emotional hardships of the life that we live. Missionaries live messy, convoluted, confusing, and emotionally tiring lives. The mission field 
begs us to stay while our emotions and our selfishness call us back to the comforts of America. Our, our children have moved and lived in six different homes in the last three years. Yesterday, we were moving into a new apartment this weekend, and yesterday morning, Gia said, no, I'm not moving again. And I wanted to say, I'm right there with you. I hear you. I don't want to move again either. But my life is not my own. And so we teach our children what the gospel is all about. We teach them why we're here and what God calls us to do. Um, Hadessa said to pray for energy, or she says energy, and strength so that we do not give up. If a six-year-old knows how to ask for prayer for more energy, you know what kind of toll it might take. She gets it at her young age that missions work is hard, but it, that it's necessary. Um, like I said, she has such an evangelistic heart, and her intercession convicts me to have more of a heart like Jesus, to have more of a heart like the Father God. Church, let me tell you that there's power in your prayers. There's power in obedience to the Lord, and there's joy in sacrifice. Just before Jesus' death on the cross, he was praying in the garden. And he asked his disciples to stay with him a while and pray with him. And they kept falling asleep, probably seemingly leaving him alone in that sorrow and that angst that he was feeling. The weight of the task that was being given to him was hard, and it was unwanted. I want to look at Matthew chapter 26. Verses 36 through 46. <clears throat> then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here a while and I will. Jesus literally prayed three different times, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, and yet not my will, but yours be done. If I'm honest, I can't tell you how many times I've prayed a similar prayer. I love India. I have come to love Nepal. I love what I do. I love watching Jesus at work. I love seeing lives be transformed. I love seeing people come to saving knowledge in Christ. But it is hard. And there are days where I just say, God, I don't want this. It's too hard. I, I, don't, I don't like it this way. I want it to be this way. And so I, I express my heart to the Lord, and I just pour it out. And then I come into this place of peaceful surrender where I say, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus was fully human, and yet he was fully God. And he cried out to the Father in the garden, 
And he was saying, this is hard. God, I don't want to go to the cross. I, I wish it could be different. And yet Jesus was without sin. So we know that it's okay for us to tell God our thoughts and how hard it is for us. It's okay to admit those things to him. But it's obedience to the Father that's key. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus needed to go to the cross. There would be no gospel apart from him not going to the cross. Jesus desires for us to carry our cross, our hardships, that others might hear the gospel and see his power in our lives and be transformed, that through our testimony, Jesus would be glorified. Jesus prayed the same prayer three times, and sometimes I think God keeps us coming to him in prayer. Sometimes you don't just go once and say this is hard and then be strengthened for the journey. You have to go again and again and again. And I'm probably way more weak than Jesus. I probably go about 17 times before I get in my inner being that strength that comes from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's when I go to him that he works that power of the Holy Spirit in me for a surrendered obedience to what he wants. Today is Pentecost Sunday. We can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. Whether you're preaching on the side of the road here in America, whether you're talking to someone at work who doesn't want to hear the gospel and seems really cold and, and distant, whether you're answering the call of a homeless child at your gate, I can't do it without the Holy Spirit, and neither can you. Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. I sometimes wonder if Jesus and his uh, fully human nature needed the encouragement and truth of the Father spoken over him in those different prayer times that he kept going back in order to strengthen his spirit man to endure the cross. He was fully God, so maybe not. He probably already had all the strength he needed, and yet he was fully human. And so maybe he just needed to hear the Father say it one more time. One thing I know is that we need to be strengthened in prayer for our passion and to have resolve and our ability to obey. We don't need encouragement when things are easy. We don't need a kick in the pants when things are going good. It is in hardship that we learn what trust and faith and obedience really are. As Matthew 26 says, Jesus told his disciples to pray that they wouldn't fall into temptation. I often found that part interesting. Um, I think temptation here is the sin of giving up. Giving up on faith. Giving in to the lies of the enemy. Giving in to doubt. Giving up on our convictions. Giving in to what's easy and giving up on things that God has called us to. God had called his people to pray with him. That was a call to his people. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Hadassah says, Pray for energy so you don't give up. Hebrews 12, 1 through, uh, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with endurance the race that is set out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have completely forgotten, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as father, as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone that he accepts as son. So endure hardship as discipline. James 1 talks about consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience hardship. 
here he's saying, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. <clears throat> Moreover, <clears throat> Moreover, we have all human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. And later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Here's the key, verse 12. Therefore, therefore, like it's hard, but therefore strengthen, thank you so much, Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. To me, that, that verse almost seems out of place. But what he's saying is if you endure, if you allow the Father God to help you work through the hardship, then you get to this place where you're strengthened so that you can go to the disabled and see them healed. Well, it's not just disabled. It's so that you can go to the village where they've never heard Jesus. It's so you can answer the gate at 6 a.m. in the morning. It's so that you can get up at 6 a.m. and go to your workplace and tell someone Jesus loves you. If I don't allow him to strengthen me, I won't go to the places that he calls me. God is saying, I know you're weak. I know you're frail. I know you're human. I know you're selfish, and I know you want it your way. I know you want to give up. I know you have a will. I have a very strong one. I know you don't want to bear this cross, but be strengthened. Be encouraged to say, not my will, but yours be done. Again, apart from that Holy Spirit's empowerment, we can't do it. We can't, we can't say yes. We need Jesus. Hadessa cries out, as I said, she'll say, God, I need you. And I'm like, she's six. And she's saying, God, I need you. I need you. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I need you more. Help me. <laughs> we have to keep running to him in prayer as many times as it takes to be filled with faith to press on. As many times as it takes to lay down our will as many times as it takes to pick up the cross or the hardship and whatever it is and follow Jesus' example, as many times as it takes to be obedient to the call of God on our lives, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured. I can tell you that there's no greater joy than seeing salvation of souls. There's no greater joy than seeing people find Jesus or watching these deliverances. There's great joy in experiencing healing and wholeness that's found in Jesus. There's great joy that's found in obedience and sacrifice. The hardship is worth it. Jesus is worth it. And the salvation of souls is worth it. Eternity, heaven, is worth it. Today, I want to pray for you, and I want to have an altar call. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor Steve and the worship team to come back. God doesn't just call me or Manoj or, or some few in the church. He calls all of us. We're all called to something. And I want you to hear that today from the Lord. I want, I want you to ask God afresh, God, what are you calling me to? And take time to listen. And so we're going to pray for that. We're going to pray for God to reveal to you afresh. What is he calling you to today? What is he calling to you in this season of life? What is your calling? Maybe you're 65 and God is saying, you could retire now and you could move to India or Nepal with Manoj and Christina and be part of their team. Take that six-hour walk to the village. <laughs> Maybe, maybe he's saying, hey, Teen Challenge could use some help. 
I don't know what he's calling you to. Maybe he's calling you to make cookies for your neighbor every single day. I want you to also ask him what hinders the call that he's calling you to. So what is the call and what hinders it? And I want to pray for vision of the joy that's set before you to be manifested so that you're not looking at the cross and you're not looking at the hardship, but you're looking beyond. The only way that Jesus was really able to go through what he did on the cross and being separated and and being fully exposed to the fullness of Satan and sin and death is because he had that forward vision of the joy set before him. He knew what it was worth, and so he endured. So I want to pray for you to have that vision of the joy to be manifested now, that you see what you're working towards, so that whatever it is that's hindering you just becomes like the, the hurdle that the runner has to jump over. It's, it's not the finish line. It's the hurdle to jump over to get to the furnace finish line. And I want you to be encouraged today to press on. So I'm going to let the worship team um, lead us. And I'm going to just open the altars. And if you would like prayer as you're sitting here, just raise your hand. And I'm going to come pray. Manoj can come pray. We want to pray with you if you want that. If not, they're just open for you to just seek the Lord and to hear from him. What is the call on your life? What is the hurdle? And let him reveal to you that joy that's set before you. Just lay hands and pray. You can come. Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, bowing here. I find my rest. I find my rest. Without you. Temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. You're my one. 
I know this whole song, but I'm just going to try to sing it. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. Seeking you as, seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. want to just close our service in prayer in thanksgiving and we certainly want you to know that there's prayer for anybody in the chapel area for individual prayer if you would like and I'm just going to pray that prayer that God told Moses to tell Aaron to, and his sons to pray this over the children of Israel may the Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed day. <laughs>